I'd like to welcome everyone to the Society of Skeletal Radiology's first uh, Resident Education Club webinar. My name is John Jacobson. I'm from the University of Cincinnati, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. One quick housekeeping note, you'll be able to ask questions throughout the webinar by simply entering that into the Q&A function of the Zoom menu, not the chat, but the Q&A. I'd like to now introduce our speaker for today's session, Dr. Artemis Petridis from the University of Cincinnati. Artemis, take it away. Great, thank you, John. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I would also like to thank uh, the SSR and uh, the Resident Education Club, as well as Sodidi for this opportunity. I will um, start off. So as most of you know, I'm coming to you live from Cincinnati. Actually, I'm coming to you from somewhere over here. Uh, I've lived here for about uh, four years now. I never would have actually imagined that I would have been living in Cincinnati, but it's actually a very nice city. It reminds me of a, a mini New York City. I've been at the um, University of Cincinnati Medical Center for my whole time here, which has given me uh, great opportunities as an academic institution with multiple affiliated uh, athletics programs. I am fortunate to work with a great group of people. Uh, we are currently um, six faculty in MSK, we seem to be seven. We have two fellows a year and uh, we have eight residents that rotate um, through um, our section every year. So um, the objective of this lecture is to review some interesting knee MRI cases using predominantly the axial planes. Uh, and uh, the reasoning behind this is because my approach to any knee MRI um, always starts with the axial plane. I find it uh, extremely useful and I think it's a relatively underutilized uh, plane. It is a great resource to learn anatomy and thereby a great way to identify pathology. So my hope and goal is that by the end of this lecture, you will have a greater appreciation of the value of the axial plane and maybe actually utilize it as you go forward. So um, let's begin. So our first case, um, as I said, all our uh, cases will start as axial imaging. Our, most of them are PD fat saturated imaging. And as far as clinical history, um, I, we, for all of our cases, we will take the always so useful uh, presenting with pain. Um, so uh, this, our first case, hopefully um, after looking at it for a few, um, seconds, you can see that there are some obvious abnormalities present. Um, if we start off, we can see that there's a joint effusion. And then if we continue to look at um, abnormal edema signal, we will see that there is some signal in the lateral femoral condyle. There's also some abnormal signal in the medial patella consistent with contusions, what we often refer to as kissing contusions. If you also look at the articular surface of the medial patellar facet, you will see that there is irregularity to it as opposed to the lateral surface. And um, along the same lines, if you look in the lateral aspect of the joint, you will see that there's this structure that actually has imaging characteristics of both bone and cartilage. This is actually the cortical line. Um, and this is a fragment of an osteochondral fragment that has originated from this patella. Now, as you start to piece this together, you, some of you may know what the mechanism of injury is. So if we look over here at the medial retinaculum and MPFL, you will see that even though it is not torn, um, it is not um, sort of normal in appearance. It has attenuated morphology in areas. It has a redundant morphology in others. Uh, and there is this increased uh, signal that is attachment. So even though it's not a full thickness tear, there is definitely at least some partial tearing of the ligament. So now putting all these uh, imaging findings together, uh, this is a nice classic example of a transient lateral patellar dislocation. Uh, this is common in young active patients. Uh, the pretty classic appearance is that just like our case, the kissing bone contusions and a potential MPFL injury, there may be other ligamentous bone or soft tissue injuries associated with it. Um, the mechanism of injury is a flexed knee position with internal rotation on a planted foot with a valgus component. 
Um, and about 50% of patients have subsequent dislocations and chronic instability, and that can lead to pretty severe arthritis due to the continued uh, cartilage injury. There are certain predisposing factors to pedellar instability. Um, one is trochlear dysplasia, which is a congenital variant, and I just included some images here on the right of, of the different types. Another one is patella alta, which is just a long patellar tendon, which is also a congenital variant, uh, usually asymptomatic. And then we also have um, lateralization of the tibial tuberosity, which is an increased uh, distance between the tibial tubercle and trochlear groove, and you can actually just see this down here um, as a representation of how we typically um, evaluate that on MRI. And then there's other secondary factors which are, um, are not as common but are, are listed here. Now MRI is um, very sensitive in identifying any bone and soft tissue injuries as well as the pre-mentioned uh, predisposing factors. The most common finding we will see was MPFL injury. There will be the contusions that we talked about. Um, the patella can be subluxed or tilted after initial dislocation. There can be an chondral or an osteochondral lesion with intraarticular bodies. Uh, there can be uh, injury to the vastus medialis or obliquus muscle. Um, and then there can also be additional findings depending on the extent of injury, uh, either meniscal, cruciate, or other kind of ligament injuries. So that's the end of our first case. John, I don't know if you wanted to add something. Uh, no questions. Uh, so if I just can make a point, Artemis, yes. a great case, a very common entity and great teaching points. Uh, one uh, point I was gonna make is to emphasize that bone bruise that's along that lateral aspect. That's different from the ACL related bone bruise, which is more central. And the last point is, the kissing patellar bone bruise may be absent, some say in up to 50% of cases. So it's that lateral from McConnell bone bruise right along that edge, which is so characteristic. Thank you, Artemis. Great, thank you. All right, so we're gonna go on to our second case. Uh, this case has a few more subtle findings, but before we actually go to the case, I wanted to um, review a little bit of anatomy. So we're gonna have, uh, a quick poll. Hopefully you will have a little poll box that appears in front of you. Uh, so please go ahead and select what you think this anatomy is. What is this structure? So good, yes. So uh, I'm not sure if all of you can see the results, but 88% of you said medial retinaculum, and that is the correct answer. Uh, let me. Sorry, one second. My. Oops, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So uh, a good way of what when, when looking at these. Um, kind of questions, it's important to know to be oriented as to where you're looking, and sometimes that can be hard. Uh, when we have the knee and we're looking at the anterior compartment, if you look at the longer aspect of the joint, that's typically the lateral um, part, and then this is medial, so that will automatically help orient you. Um, so this would not be the lateral collateral ligament. Um, and then these other structures that I've listed are actually further back, so the lateral collateral ligament would be here further down, medial, would be here and then the ACL would be here. All right, so now moving to our actual case. Uh, this is, like I mentioned, a little bit more subtle than our prior case. Um, and 
A good tip is when you're looking at cases, if you can't see an abnormality right away, something to look for is just bright signal, which would typically be edema signal. So when looking at this case, you know, there is a little bit of trace fluid in the joint, which is likely just some physiological fluid. But then when we're looking a little bit more posterior here, we can see that there is increased signal uh, within this space, which is superficial to the lateral femoral epicondyle and deep to this structure, which is the iliotibial band. And um, there's also a little bit of edema superficial to that. So this is actually our finding. And there's not much else that this could be in this setting. So this is a, a nice example of iliotibial band friction syndrome. And here's just a coronal of that same, of the same case, just showing the same findings of this edema signal interposed between the IT band and the bone. So uh, the iliotibial band is just thickened fascia. It coalesces from the tensor fascia lata, the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius, proximally at the level of the greater trochanter. And then they course distally to the tibia at, um, and attach to a Gerdes tubercle. It, um, the friction syndrome is just an overuse injury, just the repetitive friction between the, the band and the bone with both active flexion and extension results into these inflammatory changes. Uh, it's commonly seen in athletes like runners and cyclists. Uh, there is propensity in people who have certain anatomical variants, like if you, they have genuverum or excessive foot pronation, or if they have a prominent lateral femoral epicondyle. And clinically, it can be mistaken for internal derangement. Um, or, you know, it's just like meniscal or ligamentous injury. So it's just important to be able to distinguish it. On uh, MRI, the um, findings are, are relatively straightforward. You'll have edema between the IT band and the lunar femoral epicondyle. Sometimes it can develop into an adventitial bursitis. So you will have more organized cystic fluid structure there. And then there can be chronic changes, which would include thickening of the band and uh, more superficial edema. And just something to keep in mind, a pitfall is that you want to distinguish the um, what is the lateral synovial recess and not confuse it for any inflammatory changes. So um, we actually have this nicely in our case because you can see that this is the synovial recess and it shouldn't really go beyond the um, epicondyle. So if you were to have um, the whatever signal you were seeing stopping here, then it's unlikely to be IT band friction syndrome, as opposed to these inflammatory changes that are interposed back here. All right, and that is the end of our second question or case. Okay, thanks, Artemis. Great case. Uh, so there are three questions that popped up relate to both the medial and lateral uh, retinaculum. Uh, okay. One is, is the medial patellofemoral ligament and the retinaculum the same? Okay. Uh, part of them form a same structure as it goes close to the patellar attachment, but they actually, it is hard for us to distinguish many times where the actual one ends, one begins on MRI, but they are technically two separate structures, but they do form conjoined and they line all the entire medial aspect of the knee. Um, I'm not sure if, um, John, you had anything to add to that. Yeah, in, in the literature, it's interesting because there are different controversies of how many layers there are to the medial retinaculum. Most people say three, and some people define the middle layer uh, as the MPFL. Now, as Artemis is saying, we can't resolve that typically. And basically we just say, well, it's in there. And if we're in an axial cut right in the middle of the patella, you just kind of circle that area and say, yep, that's it. Uh, so yeah. I agree with that comment. <laughs> uh, another question regarding the case you just showed, Mm -hmm. Why is the iliotibial band not the lateral patellar retinaculum on that axial view? So the lateral patellar the lateral retinaculum is further anterior to it as opposed to that posterior, um, and it's just part of. I can go look at it further. So the retinaculum would be here, as opposed to the IT band, which is posteriorly over here. And then if, yeah, and then if I can just add uh, on that point, so mm -hmm. you could, you'll be able to track the iliotibial band or track to Gertie's tubercle where the mm -hmm. retinaculum will more closely follow the joint recess and uh, attach to the femur. So that's another way of mm -hmm. defining that. Okay, 
Thank you. All right. Great. All right, our next case um, is a video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the video once and see if you guys, uh, it does go a little quick, but maybe you'll pick up the entity. Um, then I'll show it one more time and tell you to direct your attention to the ACL. And now I'm going to go through it a little bit and a little slower. So just when you start off looking at the knee and you're looking at your ACL, you should see a hypointense structure from the intracondylar notch here um, along the lateral side, and its course should be oblique to the anterior aspect, anterior medial aspect of the tibial spines. So as we start to look at our case here, there's just this sort of intermediate signal here. We're not seeing the classic hypointense signal that should be up against the bone. Um, just as an add-on, there's, there's definitely a joint effusion, so that's also pointing that there's something going on. If we progress a little further down, again, you're seeing you're not seeing that classic strided appearance of the ACL as it's coursing. You have this intermediate signal fluid. You're starting to see something here, um, and as we go further down, now you have this structure back here that shouldn't be. And if you follow this structure on the subsequent slices, you will see that it courses down to the tibial spine attachment. So that is actually the ACL where it should be um, attaching to the femoral condyle, but it's not. Um, and then on this plane, I included it because you can see that there is edema signal in the posterior tibia here and the tibial plateau. But then there's also this structure here um, with um, edema interposed between this hypointense linear structure. Uh, and what this is, is an avulsion fracture um, of the capsule as it attaches here. So this is our classic Sagan fracture that we would see on radiograph. Uh, and this is just, look at the same entity on the sagittal. So as you see, here is our ACL. And instead of coursing up here, it's coursing down here, and it's just floating uh, in the back of the joint. Um, these are just uh, representative images, again, indicating, just showing the same pathology. Um, and then this is just another view of what the Sagan fracture would look like on our coronal images, um, where it's evolved off from the tibia, and it has this uh, reactive edema seen in the proximal tibia. So this is uh, an ACL tear. Um, it's, so the ACL is an intraarticular extrasynovial structure. It consists of two bundles, the anterior medial and the posterior lateral. Um, the anterior medial bundle is the stronger and tauter one with flexion and then lax with um, extension, while the posterior lateral bundle has opposite characteristics. So they actually have reciprocal tension pattern, and this allows for stability throughout all normal range of motion. It resists anterior tibial translation with extension, and it provides rotational stability. And um, it is the most commonly injured ligament in the knee and it can be partial or complete. And uh, the most common mechanism of injury is typically a pivot shift injury, uh, but um, it can also be seen with hyperextension injuries. Uh, MRI can show many different findings, the you know fiber discontinuity, empty notch like our case had, there can be thickening or edema of the um, ligament depending on how acute or subacute the injury is. Uh, there are typically uh, contusions that we see along the posterior tibial plateau and then the mid to anterior portion of the femoral condyle. There can be resorption um, of the residual stump if it's been chronically torn. And then with partial tears, they can be a little bit more tricky to diagnose because um, there's continuity of fibers for the most part. So you maybe just be looking for some increased signal, maybe some laxity in fiber and just an attenuated morphology. Um, indirect signs that uh, help for identifying ACL tears, one is the Sagan fracture, like it's present in our case, and it's just a cortical avulsion of the uh, interlateral capsular attachment. Um, there can be avulsion fractures of both the proximal or, or distal attachments of the ACL itself. And then there can be what's called the lateral femoral notch sign or the deep sulcus sign, which is just an impaction fracture of the um, condylopatellar sulcus of the lateral femoral condyle. All right, and that's the end of our third case. John? Excellent. Um, if I can put in a plug for radiographs, I'm kind of old school. Yes. And yeah. one point I want to make is that when these small avulsions come off any bone, mm -hmm. all the edema that occurs on the MR sometimes obscures the tiny flake of bone. 
So mm -hmm. always look very carefully at the radiographs with any avulsion, especially the Sagan fracture. But Artemis, there's actually a question for you related to the case. Okay. Here's the question. Given the heterogeneous appearance of the ACL normally, how can you confidently diagnose a partial tear versus this normal variability? Yeah, so that's that's where I said that the diagnosing a partial tear can sometimes it be challenging, I think, um, especially if it's been a chronic tear and all you're really seeing is an attenuated morphology and you're wondering, is this just the person's normal anatomy? Is it an old injury? Um, so it, it's definitely a challenge. I think in the acute setting, um, some laxity, maybe um, insufficiency suggested by a translation of the tibia, um, excessive edema, maybe some um, redundancy in the fibers. I think that would be some clues, but it can be a challenge. I'm not sure, um, John, if you had anything to add. Yes, and I think you, I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. Meaning that, in, with an acute partial tear, the, the ligaments usually more heterogeneous and it, it's not uniform in thickness. So the issue is when it's a chronic tear. I guess if it's attenuated, you lean toward old tear, especially if it's partly scarred to the PCL. But in the acute situation, it tends to be thickened. So I go with the thickness as well as the intrinsic uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. So before we actually move on to our pathology, let's look at another anatomy question. So you should hopefully get another little poll box uh, to name this structure. All right, great. So 82% of you identified this correctly as the transverse ligament. This is also known as the anterior intrameniscal, intrameniscal ligament. Um, let me make sure I can, good. Um, so as far as the other options, uh, this is actually a nice actual view because you can see the lateral meniscus. So this is the anterior horn. So we know that that's not um, what the arrow is pointing to. The lateral collateral ligament would be over here. It's actually the structure over here. So it's not in the region of where it's pointing. And then similarly, the Risberg ligament is one of the meniscal femoral ligaments coming off of the posterior aspect of the lateral meniscus. So it wouldn't be in this region. So good job. All right, so now actually looking at our case, again, if we follow the bright signal, um, you know, your, your eyes should bring you to this structure back here. So we have a fluid filled structure, well organized, um, has some internal heterogeneity to it. And it is deep to these three structures here. So this would be where if we were in the reading room, I would tell you, um, what are these structures? So uh, there's mnemonics for these that many of you are probably familiar with, um, say Grace with T or Sargent. So this is the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus, and they make up the pezanserine. So that would make this structure here, a bursa deep to this. So this would be pezanserine bursitis. Um, our coronal image I just added here to show how it is superficial to the MCL, so we don't we know that it's not um, something else that could be originating from the joint. So uh, bursa are just uh, synovial membrane lined spaces that fill with fluid to reduce friction between structures. Uh, the pezanserine bursa, um, like I mentioned, is deep to the pezanserine tendons, and um, it's, they are superficial to the MCL and the medial tibial condyle, and it's, it just d develops when there's overuse um, and friction, especially in athletes like runners. 
Um, and on MRI, it'll just show this oblong, sometimes multiloculated fluid collection deep to the, to, to the pezanserine tendons on the posterior medial aspect of the knee. Um, and just something to keep in mind when looking at these things is that there are many different bursa around the knee. Most of you are probably familiar with the prepatellar. Um, our um, pezanserine bursa is right here and it's courses and cysts right there, superficial to the MCL. But there's also an MCL bursa, which we would expect to be deep to it. Uh, perimeniscal cysts can sometimes protrude and pooch out into this area. The semimembranosis bursa is also back here. Uh, a Baker cyst is in the posterior medial aspect. You wouldn't necessarily expect it to be over here, but just these are all, are all structures along the posterior medial aspect of the knee that you just should be aware of when, when you come across a fluid collection. All right, John? A nice case, another very practical case. <laughs> and uh, I think Artemis really emphasizes the, the importance of understanding anatomy because these bursae can become quite complex and almost look like a sarcoma. Mm -hmm. So putting that abnormality in the location of an anatomic bursa will then allow us to go in the proper differential diagnosis in the benign category, synovial process. And as she showed, Artemis showed that it's between the pest tendons and the MCL. Artemis, you did have one question on this case. Okay. Uh, it said, actually it was the case before, so I don't know oh. if you want to answer, but here we go. Okay. <laughs> did, did the axial image also show a bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus? Um, it can, depending on the plane. So uh, meniscal tears are a challenge to identify axially for the most part, um, but sometimes complex tears can be seen um, on it. And you, whoever asked that question may have a, a sixth sense because there might be a case like that uh, in, in the next few slides. <laughs> And then regarding the, the, the case, uh, what looked like a buck and handle, that was just part of the ACL that's moved over because it was torn. You think that's what their the question was referring to? Um, let me see what, so this was for the ACL injury? Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's the, um, I guess the double PCL, it, it could have been on, on this appearance here where it's where it looks like it's coursing through that maybe, but it's a little far off to the side, but I, I could be mistaken for a displaced meniscal fragment, but that's where the other planes come in use because you would better scrutinize the uh, meniscus and you would see that that was all intact. Very good. And there's another question. How do you distinguish a pes answering bursitis from a Baker cyst? Oh, that's also a good question. Um, so it's location. It's all about location. Um, and I feel it's funny. Some of you guys are um, going or, or know what's coming, I think, in my presentation. But uh, the pezanserine is um, deep to the tendons, while the semi the Baker cyst must originate between two main structures, and that's the semimembranosis and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. So that's the medial head of the gastroc, and that's the well, semi-membranosis is here. It's not the correct plane, but um, that would be the, the distinguishing factor. Thank you. That's all the questions for the moment. Thanks. All right. So moving on to our next case. Um, again, if we follow the brightness, you will see there is scattered you know, fluid edema signal within the subcutaneous tissues, which is just likely edema. Uh, there is a joint effusion once again, and if you look inside along the synovial lining, you see that there's these protrusions, fronds, kind of like finger-like projections that extend from the synovium. They are actually the same uh, signal intensity as the fat, so it's saturated fat, so it's most likely macroscopic fat. Um, if we look at a slice a little further up again, you see these uh, projections extending into the joint from the synovium. And um, if you look at the sagittal, just as uh, just as filler, you can see that again, you have these finger-like projections. Uh, and this is a pretty pathognomonic um, appearance for lipoma arborescens. Um, this is a non-neoplastic villus synovial proliferation um, with replacement of the subsynovial connective tissue with mature fats and scattered inflammatory cells. There are two types. Uh, the primary form is less common. It affects uh, younger patients and it's idiopathic, 
while the secondary form, um, which is far more common, is uh, superimposed on an underlying arthropathy, such as rheumatoid or osteoarthritis, uh, and it affects older populations with a male predominance. Um, it affects the knee most commonly, either diffusely or as a mass-like lesion in the suprapatellar pouch, and it can affect other joints as well as bursa, and it can be bilateral. Um, symptoms are nonspecific with chronic swelling and intermittent painful effusion, painless effusion, sorry. And on MRI, it's distinctive because it has these multiple fronds of fatty tissues emanating into the joint lining with this finger-like projections. Another excellent case. Uh, I don't see any questions, so I'm, I'll just add one quick comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Remember that the suprapatellar recessor pouch doesn't have a capsule. So we often see volume averaging with normal fat lobules. It's important not to overcall lipoma mm -hmm. arborescence based on that. It really has to have a more frond-like appearance. I know that's subjective, uh, but some large lobules is actually just a normal finding where fronds of fat, subsynovial fat is really the key. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Audrey. Point. Thank you. All right, uh, this is our next case. And before our case, we'll have one more anatomy question. So hopefully you'll get your little pop-up and name that structure. All right, good. So 91% of you got this correct. And um, this is what I said that somebody asked the question before. Um, so yeah, so this is a Baker cyst. And this is, again, the classic location for it. A popliteal recess is usually um, fluid that is decompressing along the popliteal tendon. So it would be more along this trajectory posterior to the condyle. Uh, a venous valve would be along the vessel back here. And a neurofibroma would be along where we expect the courses of the nerves. And the reason I put that in there is because another reason I, I like looking at the axial is that I always look at the nerves. Um, so if you look at it, as the sciatic nerve comes down, it splits into the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. The tibial nerve courses with the vessels and the common peroneal nerve goes around um, further down around the fibular neck. Um, so if you know where those courses, then you would know that that's where you would expect to find your nerve related nerve sheath tumors. Um, so I think it's, and I, the reason I always look at them is because in the set of a, a trauma or something, I don't want to overlook an injury to those. Um, but yeah, so good job. So this is a Baker cyst. Um, and so um, let's see who was paying attention a few minutes ago and tell me where, um, between what two structures do Baker cysts arise? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> And I love that that was added because that was running in my head each time we had a poll question. So that's perfect. Uh, yes, correct. I'm going to pretend that that last person clicked that by mistake. But yes, it is between the semimembranosus and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. Um, and a way for you to remember that is with the m, &M as the um, mnemonic. And yeah. So moving on to our actual case. Uh, this is a very nice case. These are three uh, different slices of the same knee at different levels, showing again, once again, a joint effusion. Um, and then there is this 
uh, hypo intense signal along the entirety of the lining of the joint. Um, it's thickened, um, it's really low in signal. There's some internal um, components. You can see that it's lining all around anywhere that we see, even the Baker cysts um, that we identified. Um, and if you look at it on the other sequences, so this is a PD non-fat set, but also on the T1 that, that I don't have included at all there, it's always hypo intense on all sequences. And again, you can see it lining up um, along the capsule, uh, along the synovium. And um, if you were to have a hint of what this would be pre, you would order a specific kind of sequence. Uh, usually we don't have, um, but uh, we would need a gradient echo sequence, which we can actually cheat and use our scout images. That's why the quality of the image is not as great, but it is a perfect um, representation of what happens on the gradient echo image, which you get this susceptibility artifact or blooming artifact along the areas where we have this dark um, signal along our um, synovium and you would see it again fire up and you can also see it here on the coronal image. And that's because there is hemosiderin in whatever this process is that's causing this blooming artifact. And that's pretty pathognomonic for PVNS or pigmented villanodule synovitis or um, it's a form of tenosynovial giant cell tumor. It's an uncommon benign neoplastic monoarticular proliferative disorder. It's common in young adults. It mostly affects the knee and then it's followed by other large um, joints. Classically affects an articulation in a diffuse or disseminated fashion. And the symptoms include a palpable mass, some swelling, and then large recurrent bloody joint effusions uh, leading to the hemocytorin deposition and accelerated arthritis. On imaging, uh, radiographically, we usually don't see much. There might be an effusion and it might be hyperdense. Um, there may be well-marginated erosions, but those can be a late finding. Uh, the joint spaces are relatively preserved and there's no mineralization, which is an important consideration because there are other entities that affect the joint and the synovium that do have mineralization. So this would help distinguish that. On MRI, you have this low signal intensity of the proliferative synovial tissue on all the sequences with the susceptibility or blooming artifact that um, we saw on ours on the gradient echo images, and that's because of the hemosiderin deposition. All right, any, John? Nice case. There is a question here for you, Artemis. Okay. Uh, what's your opinion about using the term, quote, typical popliteal cyst? end quote, instead of Baker cyst? Hmm. Um, I don't know if I, I've always used Baker cyst. I don't, uh, I think it is used pretty interchangeably, but I don't, I don't know if I really have an opinion. Um, John, do you have uh... Yeah, so it's funny when one says popliteal cyst, most people think, oh, Baker cyst, but other people would say, doesn't that just mean a cyst in the popliteal region? And it's not mm -hmm. specific. I guess you could debate that, or you could call it by its true name, the semimembranosis neogastrocnemius bursa. Power scribe would never get that right. <laughs> so in my opinion, I think they're synonymous. And as long as wherever you're, you're working, that people will use the same language, that's, that's fine by me. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's another question. How do you distinguish PVNS from resolving hemarthrosis from trauma or hemophilia? Good question. Okay, that's a that's a very good question. Um, the and I would I'll ask John to to contribute a little bit. I think, but for, as far as for the um, bloody just a fusion from trauma, it would be more layered. It would be in a certain region, and it wouldn't be so proliferative and and uh, chronic in appearance. Um, and it, uh, I forget what was the other um, distinguish distinguished uh, from? hemophilia. Oh, hemophilia. I think along the same, it, it's more of deposit of blood as opposed to synovial proliferation. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, bl blood in the joint to that extent would be quite uncommon. Mm -hmm. And usually yeah. someone who's hemophilia, they know about it clinically. And you're probably more likely to have yeah. subcontinual cysts with hemophilia because it's more chronic, repetitive, where we'll see more of an, an extrinsic erosion with PVNS. Um, which is, you know, is a, a form of tenosynovial giant cell tumor, but I'm just using PVNS for sake of discussion. Mm -hmm. There's another question here. Are you ready? Yeah. I should read <laughs> these first. 
Uh -oh. If you had an x-ray that did not show calcifications around the knee, is the grain echo sequence necessary? If it does not bloom, does that change your diagnosis or prompt a biopsy? Does it change? Um, if the x-ray alone, I mean, depending on what the clinical indication is, if you have a joint effusion and non-resolving pain, then an MRI is almost always indicated or followed just to see what the underlying pathology is. Um, as far as if there isn't blooming, you should, you expect to have blooming with PVNS unless it's really early on and there haven't been changes yet. But if there, if, if it doesn't fit the classic um, description or appearance of PVNS, then I, a, a biopsy is always helpful or warranted. Yeah, um, they could go right to the synovectomy. And usually if you, what we're getting at with the calcification, PVNS rarely calcifies, mm -hmm. I've never seen it, but they say rare. Right. It doesn't really look like synovial chondromatosis, which mm -hmm. are more smaller sub, sub synovial low signal. This is just diffuse synovial thickening. So they have a different appearance. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Artemis. Thank you. All right. We have another case. I'm going to show the video first and see if anybody picks up on the abnormality. And now I'm gonna run it again and tell you that to focus on the medial compartment. And for whoever asked that question before, this is why I said that they read my mind or saw my slides because this is actually a bucket handle tear. So like I mentioned, most meniscal tears, we don't really see well on um, axial images because they're usually out of plane um, of our slices, but this is, a, a great example of a bucket handle tear where you see what's left of the meniscus um, in the periphery of, on the medial side, and then you have this displaced fragment um, extending into the intercondylar um, or the tibial spine area. And if you look at it on sagittals, <clears throat> you can see how there's, there's diminutive morphology of the meniscus. Um, and then you have this flipped fragment in here, which looks kind of like that second PCL sign. Um, and then additionally, if you look at it as it courses and flips anteriorly, you have these two triangles in front or double, um, double delta sign is another way it's been described. Uh, so yes, so this is a bucket handle tear, which is just a longitudinal tear where the central, um, there is central migration of the inner handle or the inner torn fragment. So just a quick review, there are three main type of tears we typically talk about. We talk about a horizontal tear, um, a longitudinal tear, and then a radial tear. And uh, based on how these are, you can see that how they can be difficult sometimes or many times to catch on the actual plane, on the axial plane, because it could just be a subtle line that it just completely skips over. Uh, but when it's something like a bucket handle tear, which is this longitudinal tear with a displaced um, fragment, it is easier to identify. And um, some associated MR findings, we have that absent typical bow tie morphology. There is a fragment in the intercondylar notch. There could be a double PCL sign. There could be an anterior, um, a double anterior horn or flipped meniscus, like in our case. There could be a disproportionately small posterior horn, like our case. And then if it's a lateral meniscal bucket handle tear, which is really not that common, there can be a double ACL sign on MRI. John? Here I am. Okay. Uh, so there is, uh, there's a question here. Okay. In order to see a double PCL sign, do you have to have an intact ACL? Do you have to have intact ACL? Yeah, without an intact ACL, the flipped meniscus can go to different regions or different place. So the ACL typically keeps it in place to make, to give that appearance of a double PCL sign. And then there's one other question regarding how do you identify a meniscal capsular tear? I don't know if that's something that you want to get into, or is it later, or would you like to answer it? It's up to you. Um, a meniscal capsule, like a ramp lesion. So those those would be really hard to identify on an axial image. Uh, those mostly we would see on a sagittal view. That's why I say that um, the axial plane is not ideal for all meniscal tears, um, and there, there's a lot of controversy behind capsular injuries in general. So I think I'd probably leave it at that for now, unless you have something to add, John. 
No, I agree. Um, we know all the indirect signs of meniscal capsule separation has been shown are really not great. Now there's yeah. this, the ramp lesion and there's different ways that this is being classified. I think we're still sorting out our accuracy in these diagnoses. Okay, yeah. go ahead. All right, great. So our last case of the day uh, is another little video. I'm going to show it again once to see if you guys can um, pick up anything. And just like on all the other ones, if you sort of follow where all the edema signal is, you'll see it's on the lateral side. And then I will go through it one more time a little slower. And as we start to go down from the um, lateral epicondyle, I'm, we're gonna ignore for now. I mean, this was a polytrauma, so there was a lot more things, but I wanted to just point out um, the structure here that should be attached to the um, femoral condyle, but is not. Instead, it is irregular in morphology and thickened and not originating from the proper place um, and intermediate in signal. And this is the, um, the lateral collateral ligament. So this is a tear of the LCL and you can see it also really nicely on the coronal plane where you see it's just complete fluid in between um, its expected attachment and where the ligament is. Um, and so the uh, LCL arises from the lateral femoral condyle and it starts um, onto the fibular head um, in the middle third laterally, sometimes joins with the biceps femoris. Um, lateral compartment knee injuries are less common than medial compartment injuries. Um, they can be isolated or in conjunction with other ligaments, especially in the posterior lateral corner and the crucial ligaments. And it can be a proximal, a mid-substance, or at the tibial insertion commonly. And that is the end of our case. And John? Hey, thank you, Artemis. Uh if there are any questions, please pop them into the Q&A uh, folder. Um, I think Artemis did a great job of showing what the axial image can provide. And it really truly emphasizes the need to understand the anatomy, not just on one plane, but all planes. And you've shown <laughs> nicely that this axial view can show tons of information and even is the best imaging plane. So you have to really be comfortable uh, with that. And then also uh, when you're learning and your search pattern for MRI, everyone has their own different approach. And, but the, in the end, you need to have a pattern that works for you and your checklist to look at these structures. So then you can incorporate these findings from the axial image as well as the other planes as well. Yep. One question just showed up here, Artemis. Okay. It said grading of ligament injury, question mark. Grading of ligament injury and then how we grade it or, well, um, so I, I typically don't use grades in my um, reporting. Uh, some people do. I just go by the classic descriptors. So if there's just, if the ligament is intact and there is periligamentous edema, um, I typically call that a sprain. If there is partial tearing, I'll say associated, I'll say there's a sprain with partial tearing. And then if there's a complete tear, I just call it a complete tear. So I actually avoid the grading systems in most cases, but that's my personal preference. I, I don't know if, <laughs> if John would agree with that or not. Yeah, it also depends on the ligament. I mean, for me, I'm trying to decide partial or full thickness tear is really the dichotomy versus you know, normal everything else. Mm -hmm. For example, the PCL has been shown that we cannot be accurate using MR to differentiate partial from full thickness tear. So that's easy. I just say it's injured or it's torn. Uh, for the ACLs, I try to say partial or full in case one of the bundles are torn. For the MCL, it's even more complicated because that ligament isn't a cable, it's like a piece of lasagna. So uh, it's been shown in the literature that we are grade one, two, three is inaccurate in predicting what happens clinically. So it's difficult and every ligament is a little different. Um, in the end, describing what you see and then determining if there's a full thickness tear, uh, showing if it's wavy and retracted, I think that's the, the ultimate goal. Yeah. Uh, another quick question here, mm -hmm. maybe quick. Do the orthopedic <laughs> surgeons fix the LCL sprain or complete tear? Um, not the sprain and the tear, it kind of depends. Um, many times it's not in isolation, so they'll go in to fix other things and maybe address the LCL. Uh, but I, I do think it's one of those structures that I, they'll attempt to leave to 
um, scar down or heal before attempting to, but I, I, I think it varies amongst orthopods. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it depends on the patient too. A high level yes. athlete versus uh, someone's uh, grandmother or whatever. Yes, there was another question. Like, in the last case, was there a palpiteous tendon tear? There was good pickup. Yes, there was injury to it. It wasn't fully torn, but it was abnormal in signal and a, a little irregular morphology and maybe partially torn. But yes, good, good eye on whoever picked that up. All right. Any final question? Oh, here comes one. Okay. Why could, is it important to describe separately the tears of the deep component of the MCL complex? versus the superficial component. So important. Um, yes, I, it, it is because, I, and again, I think it fits well with when we talk about people who just grade, um, what is it that we're talking about? Are we talking about the superficial? Is the whole thing torn? Is it's only the deep fibers are torn? Um, many times if, it, it'll affect what they treat or what they do to repair. So I do think it's important to, to specify which is injured and which is not. Um, I'm not sure if, if John, you have a different opinion or. Yeah, I, th I, th I agree with that. And we know that the, the deep layer, the meniscal femoral, meniscal tibial components, they tear first and they're really not yeah. as strictly as important. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times uh, when I look at those deeper fibers, I'm not always confident because they're small and there's edema, but I really try to bring home is that superficial layer. Actually, it's the middle layer, depending on what you read. But what we call a superficial thick layer, is that okay? That's when that uh, confers the mechanical stability to, to the medial knee. Mm -hmm. Got another question here. Okay. So when you see fluid signal abnormality around the knee, is there a need to uh, give intravenous contrast, for example, to exclude uh, synovial sarcoma or nerve sheath tumor? Uh, so contrast is important. It all depends on where this abnormality is and what it looks like. If, if you have, that's the, the little bit of scary thing about MRIs and the thing, anything that looks like fluid on T2 sequences isn't necessarily fluid. Um, it can be solid. Uh, if you're confident about the location enough, such as like our bursa or something like that, then no. If it's something that looks like a classic peripheral nerve sheath tumor, you know, along its course, contrast isn't necessarily going to contribute a lot. But if there's anything that looks out of the ordinary in an unusual, un unexpected location, especially in the, in the posterior popliteal st structures, um, I would give contrast because there are a lot of scary sarcomas that appear back there. And that's why it's important to not just group everything back there as a Baker cyst um, because, yeah, you don't know what can be back there. I can't overemphasize the point that Artemis just made. Uh, I've seen cases of, quote, Baker cyst turn up synovial sarcomas and mixed white liposarcomas. Uh, of course, at an outside institution, we always say that. <laughs> whatever that means so but exactly what Artemis said if you see fluid signal first of all it should be uniform and bright on t2 and it should be lower than muscle on t1 and then location if it's a bursa then that's different if it's in line with a um or if it's let's say someone with a seroma with a dark rim sign then we know that is that entity if someone has an abscess clinically you know what that is uh, if it's multilocular, like a parameniscal cyst or a ganglion, you check those off your list. But if you're left with a, quote, cyst, remember, people don't just walk around with cysts in their body then don't fit one of those categories. You really need to bring them back for contrast. Now, if someone asks, can you do ultrasound? Well, you know what? Thinking that ultrasound can be conclusive for cyst versus solid, it's not always easy. Now, of course, if it if there's internal flow on the color Doppler, then we know it's solid. But I've seen a number of cases where you have a uniform hypochoric mass-like area without through transmission, and we really can't tell. And I'll often go to the MR with, with contrast. But I think that's a very good point, because especially the Baker cyst idea, because for those who don't routinely interpret MRI of the knee, any fluid back there, oh, it must be Baker cyst. No, you have to see that neck between those two tendons. Mm -hmm. There's another question here. Okay. Uh, let's see here. 
friction syndrome versus band injury. So the question is, how do you differentiate iliotibial tibial friction band syndrome from an injury to that structure? Uh, well, the, as far as the injury, if, if the tendon, if the band is intact and all you're seeing is the edema signal, um, the most it would be would be a, a, some kind of sprain or strain. So it doesn't, it wouldn't really change much. Um, as, and if rest didn't improve or change the symptoms, then you would know that it wouldn't be the trauma. Um, and it, if it persisted, it would be related to the friction syndrome. If it were an actual injury, you would probably expect changes to the band itself. Um, besides tearing, like thickening, changes the signal. Um, and the, the history would be more, you know, um, pertinent in this case, because it wouldn't just be a, a chronic runner or a chronic athlete. It would be someone who had some kind of um, injury. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the history is very important there. And also, if you pinpoint the most severe part of the abnormality, usually it's deep to the ITB with the friction syndrome, although it can thicken and can have edema. But I would presume that if it were actually centered on a tear, of the ITB, which I don't think I've, I've seen an evolution from the Gerdes tubercle. But I think the abnormality would be more centered on that iliotibial band rather than more centered underneath it. Mm -hmm. Maybe we got time for one more question. Is that okay, Artemis? Yeah, it's fine. All right. How do you describe the fluid-like signal adjacent to the inferior border of the vastus medialis or blicus in the context of a patellar dislocation. So what does that edema mean tracking under the VMO? Edema mean tracking uh, like along the MPFL? I'm not sure. I don't know if I understand that. Yeah, so as the, the vastus medialis oblicus comes down next to the patella and those fibers mm -hmm. blend into the retinaculum. Yeah. So I think if you've diagnosed the findings of a patellar dislocation, then you see edema tracking up under the VMO proximal to the retinaculum. What does that mean to you? That there's, uh, I'm not sure. I th think it'd be disruption of the continuity of those, the muscle with the tendon. If I'm understanding the question correctly, I think I might not be, um, but yeah, not, I think. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I was hoping you would answer it so I wouldn't have to. <laughs> Uh, so what I do in that scenario is I look carefully at the architecture of the VMO. If everything looks like it's pennate and tapering down normally, I'll just kind of let that go. I was, okay, that's edema from the, the injury of the patellar dislocation location and just tracking up. If there's any uh, discontinuity of the tendon or muscle fibers or disorganization where it's bunched up, then I'll say, oh, the VMO is probably mm -hmm. torn to a little bit. I've never seen it completely retracted because it really fans out and the fascia becomes part of the retinaculum. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So I see no more questions. So the first thing I want to mention is that we would like uh, everyone to fill out a survey to let us know how we're doing. This is our first session and we're going to repeat this forever. No, we're going to repeat it monthly for and see how it goes. The survey will be dropped into the chat part of this Zoom menu. So when you get a moment, go into that and fill out that survey. All right. Okay, so Artemis, I wanna thank you for uh, your presentation. It was very educational and I really appreciate all the work you put into it. I wanna thank the audience for tuning in and I, and I appreciate the uh, involvement with the questions and that really makes it interactive and interesting. I want to mention our next lecture, which is gonna be Wednesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, mark your calendars. This will be a very interesting talk on shoulder injections. The speaker will be Lindsay Strachko from the University of Wisconsin. I hope to see you all there and have a good night.